I'm going to take you on a journey into the dark matter of biodiversity. Now, it's going to be a journey to some interesting places, and I hope we're going to get some big surprises along the way. To get us there, let me start with a story. A few years ago, a delightful little flowering plant was discovered by an amateur botanist in the Daintree Rainforest to the north of Cairns in northeastern Australia. This species has now been named Geosiris australiensis, but we're just going to call it Geosiris for the purposes of today. Now, at the time, it generated quite a media stir because most people think that discovering a species new to science is really unusual. Well, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It's not that unusual at all. In fact, in Australia, it occurs every day. Australia is what we call biologically megadiverse. That means we have a broad range of environments, and that means we have a lot of species. And most of those species are found nowhere else on Earth. But we're also economically developed, and that means we have the capacity to do the work required to describe and name our species. And in Australia, there's a lot of work left to be done. Naming species is writing the catalogue of life. And that's what I do. I'm a botanist, but I'm also a taxonomist. That doesn't mean I stuff animals for a living. <laughs> and please do not ask me to do your taxes. <laughs> a taxonomist is a scientist who discovers, describes, classifies, and investigates the evolution of life. We explore the biosphere, and we report back on what we find. But I haven't always been a taxonomist. In fact, I'm actually a failed engineering student who decided not to pursue a life of designing and making things, but instead to go exploring. And taxonomy is big science, but without the Hadron Collider. It's big science because it has a grand scope. All life, whether that life occurs at the top of a tropical mountain, or the bottom of an Arctic lake, or in your nostrils. And it's big science because it has massive infrastructure, all of the natural history collections which in Australia alone harbour more than 80 million scientific specimens, which would cost over $8 billion to replace. And it's big science because it addresses and seeks answers to some of our most fundamental questions, such as, with whom and with what do we share our planet? And it's to that particular fundamental question that we have an awful lot of answering left to do. To illustrate, let me talk about our work on plants. So this map shows, or tallies, all of the species of plants discovered new to science across the world in the decade leading up to 2015. The top countries for plant species discovery in orange are Brazil, with over 2,200 species in a decade, and then Australia with over 1,600 species newly described to science. That's over 160 species each and every year. So we're still describing things at a cracking rate, and that rate shows no signs of slowing down. And this is occurring in a well-explored country and in a well-known group such as flowering plants. That's the situation for plants, a group that I know well. What about the rest of life? Well, in Australia, taxonomists estimate that we've so far only written about one-third of the catalogue of life. So there are vast numbers of species still remaining to describe. So many that we estimate it will take over 400 years, that's four centuries, to describe them all. Can we afford to wait four centuries? So what are all of these undescribed species? What kinds of organisms are they? To find out, let's play a little game. This pie chart represents all life, all species of life in Australia and New Zealand. 
Each slice represents a major group of organisms. It might be birds, it might be bacteria, it might be fungi or fish or plants. And the size of the slice represents the total number of species in that group, how species rich it is. And within each slice, the central portion represents the proportion of those species that are named, and the outer segment, the proportion of species we don't know. We haven't observed, but we predict they may exist. Now, what I want you to do is to think of your favourite group of organisms. I imagine for some of you it'll be birds, for others it might be plants, or insects, or bacteria. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around this pie chart from the smallest groups first, with the fewest species, and I want you to see how long it takes for your favourite group of organisms to come up. All right, let's get going. One of the smallest groups of life is the sea jellies and the corals, the cnidarians. Beautiful things. They're a small group, but we still estimate there are over 5,000 species that exist in the waters of Australia and New Zealand alone. And we've only described about half of them. What about fish? Very tasty. Of the estimated 8,000 species, there's still about a quarter of them that are unknown to science. Mollusks. Of an estimated 12,000 species, fully one-third, or about 4,000 species, still remain unknown to us. Crustaceans, also very tasty. Of an estimated 18,000 species, we've only described about half of them. Flowering plants, a group I know well. Now, this is perhaps one of the most intensively studied groups of all life. The botanical taxonomic workforce is quite substantial. And we've done a pretty good job in Australia and New Zealand. We've described about 90% of our species, we think. But that still leaves over 2,500 species, as yet unknown. Spiders and their relatives. Only one-fifth of all the species predicted to exist in Australia and New Zealand are known to us. That should scare the living daylights <laughs> out of most of you. I bet some of you are wondering when your group's going to come up. I bet some of you chose birds. There's probably a few mammal lovers in the audience. Maybe reptiles or frogs. So are these groups significant? Where do they fit on that pie chart? Are they significant? Well, I'm sorry to say they're not. Altogether, those four groups of life total about 3,000 species, and we've named almost all of them. So what are those big segments on my pie chart? What kinds of organisms are they? Well, as it turns out, the biggest groups are all small things. So what does that tell us about how we think of biodiversity? It tells us that the world mostly belongs to the microbes. We notice the big and the loud and the colourful things. But in the catalogue of life, those big and loud and colourful things are really just a few tiny chapters. So that's a run through the biodiversity of Australia and New Zealand. What's known and what's not known. But I want to get back to the title of my talk, The Dark Matter of Biodiversity. You may have heard this term, dark matter. Space scientists use it a lot. And to them, it means all of that stuff in the universe, thought to make up more than 80% of the matter, but which we've not yet been able to directly observe using any instruments that we've built. It's invisible. The analogue for biodiversity is all of those species we're not able to observe using normal means. We can't see them with our eyes, they make no sound, and we can't grow them in petri dishes, in a lab. But the great majority of the undiscovered species belong 
to this dark biodiversity. So do we really know who we share our planet with? Where do you find this dark biodiversity? To think about this, let's go back to our little friend, Geosiris. This little flower looks so alone. But looks can be deceiving because in its rainforest home, it's intricately connected with countless other species of life. Its roots are colonised by microscopic fungi that also colonise the roots of other neighbouring plants of other species and help them extract nutrients from the soil. The above-ground parts of the plant are colonised by other different fungi. In the roots and the leaves and the petals and the stems living between the cells of the plant. Sometimes you can find dozens and dozens of individual species of fungi within one plant. And then there's all the pathogens, numerous species of bacteria and fungi and phytoplasmas. And then the soil organisms, again, millions of species of bacteria and fungi and algae and tiny worm-like nematodes, all of them, organisms so tiny that billions of them can exist in a handful of soil. So this little flower is anything but alone. She's intricately networked with countless other species of life. And in her rainforest home, almost all of these other species of life don't have names. So do we really know who we share our planet with? But this dark biodiversity is not just wild, it's also quite close to home. It's around us. It's on us. It's even inside of us. So do you know who you share your body with? So if we can't see all this dark biodiversity, how do we know it exists? The answer is DNA. So DNA is everywhere. You and I leave traces of it everywhere we go. You'll know this if you've watched any crime TV drama of the last 50 years. But just like we leave DNA wherever we go, so does other species of life. And DNA is like a species fingerprint. And we can use that fingerprint to identify our species. We can take very small samples of DNA from soil, from water, even from our gut contents. And the number of different kinds of DNA we find in those samples can be mind-boggling. But what's even more mind-boggling is that most of those species, or most of those kinds of DNA, don't match known species. So we can read the species' fingerprint, but we have often no idea of the organisms to which that DNA belongs. So do we know who we share our planet with? Do we really know who we share our bodies with? So does this dark biodiversity really matter? Should we care about how many species of bacteria inhabit the gut of some microscopic worm on the bottom of a lake somewhere? Does it really matter? I'd argue it does matter. And I think it matters for two reasons. The first reason is philosophical. Humans are curious creatures. We just want to know. We want to know who we share our planet with. We want to know our place in the biosphere. And we should really want to know who we share our bodies with. The second reason is entirely utilitarian. To know our biodiversity is to know and to be forewarned and forearmed, to know which species sustain us, but also to know which species may threaten us, our health, threaten our environments, or our economies. And to know our biodiversity is to know the toolkit for building a secure, a prosperous, and a healthy future. Because every species described by a taxonomist as new to science, then becomes available for other scientists to do research upon. And that research might just lead to the next wonder drug, or biofuel, or superfood, or miracle fibre. And that gives us real opportunities to work collaboratively 
with our Indigenous partners to co-develop this technology in meaningful access and benefit sharing arrangements. So I think we really need to do a lot more work to step up the rate at which we're writing the catalogue of life. Because just like Geosiris, we are networked with all other species. And can we really afford to wait 400 years to find out who we're connected to? This is why shining a light on dark biodiversity really matters, so that the lights don't go out. Thank you.